Will you please stand as you are able for our call to worship, either printed in your bulletin or on your screen. Blessed are the poor in spirit, the downtrodden and despairing. They will rejoice in God's reign forever. Blessed are those who mourn, who are grieving. They will be comforted in God's reign forever. Blessed are the ones who seek justice and righteousness. They will find it in God's reign forever. Blessed are we when we love our neighbors and seek their needs. We will live in God's reign forever. Blessed are we all when we seek to serve others in God's name. Let us worship together, serving one another and serving Almighty God. Amen. And now will you join us in our opening hymn number 288, O God of Vision. the Congregational Church on Mercer Island. I am so glad to see each and every one of you this morning on our Celebration of All Saints Sunday. We're, we will have a time in service, actually right after the passing of the peace, where I will invite you all to come forward, to light a candle, to place any mementos you may have or photos of people who have died, and you also have a chance 
to write down their names. There are piece, slips of paper and pens here, and we will build the, the, this altar together. For those of you on Zoom, and you would like to participate, I ask you to put the names of the folks that you are remembering today in the chat, and we will make sure that they are written down and added to this uh, beautiful spot up here. You also may want to light a candle where you are, and if you have photos that you would like to show us, you can, uh, if your camera's on, you can hold them up. If not, you can turn your camera on and hold them up while we are doing this. Uh, if you're on Zoom also, we will be celebrating communion today, so please have something on hand to eat and drink so that you are able to participate with us later in the service. And as always, if you have prayer requests and you're on Zoom, I ask for you to put those in the chat so they can be added to our prayers. Next week is Pledge Sunday, which is the culmination of our pledge campaign. If you haven't turned in your pledge card yet, you can bring them in person next week or you can mail them to the church office. I just have to say, I am so blown away by all of your gratitude. And thank you so much for your participation and your generosity in this campaign. Today's our monthly, monthly sandwich making for Operation Night Watch, which will take place in the library after the service. We will make 150 sandwiches, which will be shared with those on the streets of Seattle tonight. So please plan on staying to help with that effort. If you'd like to give this morning, there are a few ways you can do that. You can give online by clicking the Give Today button on our website, which is ucc-ccmi.org. You can also click the QR code in your bulletin. Uh, or if you're here in person, we will be putting. <laughs> I realize here is the table that we generally have. So we will get a plate out for you. Um, the women's breakfast is a potluck, and it will be this Saturday at 9 a.m., uh, so please plan on coming for that. Uh, I think Jeff may have a few oh. words for us. Yeah, cool. Bear with me. I get really nervous public speaking, but I'll make this quick because we got a lot going on today. You could sing it. <laughs> <laughs> I have two quick announcements. I wrote them down so that I don't wander. Uh, I am helping head up the decorating committee for the holidays. Uh, thank you to the Worship and Arts Committee for allowing me to do this. Uh, I'm very happy. Our decorating work party is Friday, December 1st. It was in the newsletter uh, this last week. There's a sign-up sheet over here just for me to have a rough, a, rough, uh, a rough idea of how many people might show up to help come at any time between 10 and 4 on Friday the 1st. Uh, the plan involves pulling from what the church has and using pieces from my event work, which I have a storage unit full of. So we're gonna create a new look while keeping the favorites and honoring the past and honoring our family. Um, so just keep the date open, sign up, love the help, okay? I'm not too much of a taskmaster, okay? Um, I want it to be fun. Uh, so my second little announcement is a little perk that being a section leader gives us is having the church for a concert or some, an event. So I am doing a cabaret. Happens to be my birthday on December 10th. It's a five o'clock. Uh, it's, so it's my birthday cabaret. It's called uh, Jeff's Playlist, a cabaret, the soundtrack in my mind. It's a big variety of music. It's five o'clock. I'm asking for a $10 or pay what you can donation at the door, which I am splitting with the church to help with our holiday giving. In the past, we've done families, the sock drive, da 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 da. I don't know what that is this year, but part of my money goes to that. So please save the date, December 10th, five o'clock. It's gonna be here. I'm gonna have a birthday cake buffet. So, you don't want to miss it. Thank you so much. And I have to say, I think I can speak on behalf of the Worship and Arts Committee that we are absolutely thrilled that you are uh, heading up the decorating. Yeah. 
Thanks. Um, I'm going to call Lily up. She is offering a bonus extra canonical gospel class, and it's going to be next Sunday, and she's going to tell you a little bit about that. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's a little better. <laughs> yeah, so next Sunday, it's going to be after church service, probably after about 15 minutes or so after end, so we can still grab food and say hi to everybody. Uh, but this one's going to be a one-off, similar to my seminar series that I had a little while ago, which I was so happy with the number of people that came. Um, this one is going to be on the Gospel of Peter, which is a not too long, but very exciting one. Um, it involves a whole kind of discussion on docetism, which we touched on like just a little bit in our main seminar series, but you do not have to have come to that main seminar series to enjoy this one. But it's really good, a little sneak peek. It involves the cross, like the actual wooden cross, hopping along and speaking. So wow. lots of fun <laughs> and a really cool opportunity to learn more about early Christianity, early Christian writings, and what was left out of our current canon. And uh, last but not least of my announcements by a long shot, I don't know how many of you have seen the women's bathroom yet. Yes. If not, go in there and just hang out in there. It is, <laughs> it is beautiful. So I am going to offer a very heartfelt thank you and a round of applause to Greg, who painted yes. it. as well as installed two new toilets in there. So um, thank you, Greg, for all you do, all your quiet work around here that goes unnoticed a lot of the time. I'm noticing. Thank you. Are there any other announcements this morning? Oh, Diane, come on up. I just wanted to let everybody know that when I prepare communion, I am using up our old plastic cups. I know that we want to be environmentally correct and use compostable things, but I also can't throw away a whole box of things that we've paid for. So just until we get rid of them all, I'm going to continue to use them. So please, just bear with us while we do that. Thank you. Did you hear that? We're putting them in the trash and not, they're not recyclable. So, uh, so we are going to do the passing of the peace, but I want to give you a little instruction before we do that. I will invite you to pass the peace. But after that, when I ring the bell, I'll ask you to come back to your seats, and then I will explain the ritual and what we will be doing. OK? Um, so, in the spirit of God's extravagant welcome, I ask you now to share God's peace with one another. If you're on Zoom, please share greetings of peace in the chat, and if you're worshiping in the sanctuary, please stand and greet one another with the peace of God.
For this ritual, the choir will begin with a beautiful chant from Taze. And I invite you all to join in once you catch the tune and the words. And as you uh, come forward, as, it, as you desire, please take one of the taper candles. Feel free to light a candle on these tables. I suggest that you start from the back forward so people aren't leaning their sleeves over lit candles. Seems it's a good safety tip. Um, there are pieces of paper and pens and places um, to lay down your mementos and photos or anything else uh, you might like to lay down. So um, those of you on Zoom, I have the instructions in the chat. I'm hoping you will participate as well. So let us move into this time of ritual. The words are, bless the Lord my soul and bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, my soul, who leads me into life.
Today's scripture comes from the New Testament, from Jesus speaking on the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he had sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The second reading is written by Nadia Bolds Weber entitled, The New Beatitudes for a Hurting World. Blessed are the agnostics Blessed are they who doubt, those who aren't sure, those who can still be surprised. Blessed are those who have nothing to offer. Blessed are they for whom death is not an abstraction. Blessed are they who have buried their loved ones for whom tears could fill an ocean. Blessed are they who have loved enough to know what loss feels like. Blessed are they who don't have the luxury of taking things for granted anymore. Blessed are they who can't fall apart because they have to keep it together for everyone else. Blessed are those who still aren't over it yet. Blessed are those who mourn Blessed are those who no one else notices, the kids who sit alone at middle school lunch tables, the laundry guys at the hospital, the sex workers, and the night shift street sweepers. Blessed are the forgotten, blessed are the closeted, blessed are the unemployed, the unimpressive, the underrepresented. Blessed are the wrongly accused, the ones who never catch a break, the ones for whom life is hard. For Jesus chose to surround himself with people like them. Blessed are those without documentation. Blessed are the ones without lobbyists. Blessed are those who make terrible business decisions for the sake of people. Blessed are the burned out social workers and the overworked teachers and the pro bono case takers. And blessed are the kids who step between the bullies and the weak. Blessed is everyone who has ever forgiven me when I didn't deserve it. Blessed are the merciful, for they totally get it. Will you please pray with me? <clears throat> May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen.
Today, on All Saints Sunday, our scripture text is the Beatitudes, which is a set of blessings at the beginning of what is known as Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And there's something of a trap hidden in the Beatitudes that I know I have fallen into, and I'm guessing you may have too. The trap is this. We often hear these words as if Jesus is setting up the conditions of blessing, rather than hearing them as the actual blessings he was bestowing on the crowd. Do you know what I mean? When I hear the Beatitudes, it's hard for me not to hear Jesus as stating the terms under which I might be blessed. For instance, when I hear, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God, I think to myself, is my heart pure? I should try to make my heart more pure. Or when I hear blessed are the peacemakers, I think yes, I should really focus more on peace, especially in these times. We have the tendency to hear some of the Beatitudes as aspirational conditions for blessing. Pure in heart, peacemakers, seeking righteousness, merciful, these are all things we might try to emulate in order to be worthy of being blessed. We may not feel particularly pure or peacemaking or righteous or merciful, but we might try to be better in those areas. Well, on the flip side, some of the other Beatitudes are conditions we would most likely want to avoid. Poor in spirit, in mourning, meek, persecuted, who wants that? But these were not a list of attributes set out for us so we could earn a blessing, so that we could earn God's favor, so that we could earn God's love. The Beatitudes are Jesus actually blessing the people who were in his midst, who were following him, who were hanging on his every word. Now, the Sermon on the Mount takes place at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, shortly after calling the disciples. Crowds were beginning to follow him, crowds that were seeking healing, spiritual healing, physical healing, hope that this man of God could improve their lives in some way. They were peasants and fisher folk, poor and oppressed by the Roman Empire. For the most part, they were not people that would think of themselves as blessed. And let's be clear, Jesus isn't telling them what they need to do to be blessed, but he's just plain blessing them. Blessing all kinds of people. All kinds of down and out, vulnerable, struggling people. Looking directly in the faces of his listeners, saying to them, Blessed are you. And why? Why would he say that? To proclaim that God regularly shows up in mercy and blessing just where you least expect God to be. With the poor rather than the rich, with those who are mourning rather than celebrating, <clears throat> with the meek and the peacemakers rather than the strong and the victorious. This is not where people of the ancient world looked for God. And quite frankly, it's not where people of our time do either. For in our culture, blessed seems to go along with the prosperity gospel. That God shows favor to us by blessing us with material goods. On social media, hashtag blessed has been a trend for a while. <clears throat> but if you ask me, I think it mostly means hashtag bragging. People post about their new cars, their nice houses, their perfect children, their perfect lives, and they tag their posts with hashtag blessed. But these Beatitudes are just about the polar opposite of that. In the Beatitudes, Jesus is blessing the human condition. God shows up here, Jesus is saying, blessing the weak and the vulnerable, blessing those who are struggling. 
And our reading of the new Beatitudes for a hurting world from Lutheran pastor Nadia Bowles Weber makes this point. That our human ordinariness, our human struggles, our human failings, do not preclude us from receiving God's blessing. God's blessing is holy, deep, and for us especially when all of our pretenses and defense mechanisms are stripped down, when we are at our most vulnerable. This past Thursday evening, a group of us attended Operation Night Watch's fundraising dinner, and we got a crash course of the Beatitudes in action. Their executive director, Deacon Frank, who some of you may remember for when he came here last spring, told moving stories about giving and receiving blessings from the most vulnerable on the streets of Seattle. He described their ministry as being about extending the love of Christ. Through the tangible support they provide, which includes the sandwiches we will make after church, but also through the slow work of building relationships. Deacon Frank told the story of a woman they have seen often up on Aurora Avenue who is a part of the sex trade. He makes the point that the sex trade intersects with human trafficking, poverty, and homelessness. And the street chaplains from Operation Night Watch have become trusted on the streets by this community. And they hand out flowers to the women, mostly single stem roses, to remind them that they are God's beloved and not forsaken. Now I'm sure many of you can relate to how special and how cherished you feel when you receive flowers. But to extend this feeling to sex workers who are the opposite of cherished, who aren't considered to be fully human by their clients but instead bodies to be used, that is some serious Jesus stuff right there. That is some serious blessing happening. And one woman that they've built a relationship with told them that she saves every petal from every flower they have ever given her. So she can remind herself that she is loved even after the flowers have withered and died. Deacon Frank told several powerful stories of their encounters with the most vulnerable, sharing stories of heartbreak and blessing and everything in between. It was clear that the folks at Operation Night Watch feel like the blessings are mutual and that they get as much as they give. And we as followers of Jesus long to be people who bless others as well as people who receive blessings. But in order to do that, we must lower our defenses to be able to acknowledge the heartbreak in this world. For this is a particularly troubled time, a particularly painful time. The war in the Middle East has revealed even more divisiveness in our already polarized society. And the suffering and horror is hard to comprehend. At the same time, our country continues to suffer mass shootings at a rate never experienced before. At the same time, our government is racked with dysfunction. And through it all, it seems we have lost our ability to show empathy to one another. But we as people of faith know that blessing and hardship often go hand in hand. Spiritual writer Parker Palmer writes, the deeper our faith, the more doubt we must endure. The deeper our hope, the more prone we are to despair. The deeper our love, the more pain its loss will bring. These are a few of the paradoxes we must hold as human beings. If we refuse to hold them in the hopes of living without doubt, despair, and pain, we also find ourselves living without hope, faith, and love. So on this All Saints Day, a day set aside on the church calendar to remember all those who have gone before us 
and to grieve their loss. We can hear, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. We hear that a little differently today, a little more personally than we might have otherwise. For to love is to risk pain, to risk getting hurt, to risk loss. And we are assured that the God who knows human pain firsthand is with us in our grief. And as we try to live out our faith, we risk being brokenhearted when the good we have tried to put into the world seems not to be bearing fruit, when it all seems too frustrating and hopeless. But we refuse to live without faith, hope, and love. So God bless you when you are brokenhearted, when you feel like you just can't take it anymore. God bless you for continuing to try to make this world a better place. God bless you when you are scared or grieving or suffering. God bless you when you seek out those who are lonely or struggling or difficult to deal with. God bless you when you do your part, even if others aren't doing their parts. God's presence is with us in this broken and hurting world. And we are assured that God's blessing goes with us, wherever and however we find ourselves. Amen.
That was beautiful, thank you. I wanted to share a little bit about when I started giving to the church many years ago. I was someone who you know, had my spreadsheet of a budget and probably spent too much time trying to manage it. And so it took me a bit to come to the determination with Jen that, okay, we'll give to the church. But then you have to insert a row on the spreadsheet for a new expense, and that's not approved by the spreadsheet. <laughs> so there's a certain tyranny that I had to let go of and realize that you know you you have to adjust somewhere when you give and you can't try to do it all you can't try to have vacations and pay your expenses and you're trying to save and you have a 401k and is that underfunded so all these sort of anxieties that once i started giving it took probably at least two years that it actually freed me up because once i kept convinced myself that the church giving was the number one priority. Then when you look at the bottom of the list, and that's easy to rationalize. There's four or five things that didn't mean as much, or I didn't have to take the time to try to figure out how, which ones to do and which ones to defer and that kind of thing. So it really gave me a lot of freedom to then explore other aspects of my spiritual development. And so again, I don't want to imply that Financial planning is bad, but there is a limit. And for me, I, I really ran into that limit. And then the other aspect of giving was giving of my time. And um, I found that that was also something that um, once I gave, I saw the benefits of that multiply, not only for myself, but for others. And, th and that was true for the financial side as well. Um, I've seen just amazing things that the congregation, this congregation has done to multiply the benefit of that giving to others. And it's, it's really qu quite amazing. And that's where I see the spirit moving. But again, that took me, it took me a number of years to kind of let that sink in. But in terms of my time in the church we were at, the, the first involvement I had was actually on the softball team. So I was invited to play in the softball team and made a lot of great connections with amazing people. And they helped bring me deeper into giving of my time. And so they also helped me prioritize in terms of, I remember someone who I really respected, he said, you know, Don, you gotta get your priorities straight. Beginning of the year, you put the church camp and the men's retreat on the calendar. And that's your priorities. And we ended up, I ended up doing those for about 20 years straight. And so the multiplication of that and just seeing the impact of that when we go to camp on my kids, on other kids, and people in the congregation was really amazing. Um, so, yeah, um, I think the goal of discipleship for me is to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And so that's the essence of spiritual multiplication. And so through my giving of financial resources and time, I've been on a journey of discipleship. And I hope that, you know, to help impart that to others as well, um, in concert with everything the congregation and everyone does. There also is a cost of discipleship, but I'll cover that in a future sermon. <laughs> oh, I mean moment. <laughs> Um, so again, it's a journey and a process, but really one full of joy. So I think one we should celebrate. Thank you. Thanks, John. It's great. All this we pray as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us in the words most meaningful for us. Holy one, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Let us not fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. We come to this table, this communion table, not because it itself is so special, but because it is an echo of another table, a table that stretches as far as the eye can see, a table that is laden with God's good gifts, a table where no one goes hungry or sits alone. A table where everyone we ever loved and whoever loved us sits and feasts together. In our own lives, we sit at tables where there are empty chairs, people we love and miss. We grieve those empty chairs, but know that in Christ, our separation is only a temporary thing. On the night before Jesus died, when he knew he would not be with his disciples much longer, he gave them a sign with which to remember him. First, he took the bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is the bread of life given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, a cup of blessing poured out for you. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. We now come to this table where all are invited and all are welcome.
Let us pray. Holy One, we remember you here as we remember all your saints. Help us to remember you not just in this sanctuary, but in our homes and schools, our cars and offices, to remember that every part of our life is infused with your grace. We are never alone, but surrounded by a cloud of witnesses united by your love. Amen. And now we please stand for our closing hymn, which I think is my very favorite hymn of all time, For All the Saints. witnesses. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Creator Christ and Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen. Amen. Zoom.